Good morning, Victory Church. Thank you. It's so good to be in Autobahn. Let us say that right. Yeah. And uh, uh, like Pastor Ed said, what a God incidence. I never thought, even when you walk into a plane grumpy because you got a middle seat, <laughs> God can turn that around to bring something amazing. And I really believe one of the most important things in this world, in this earth, are God-oriented, God-ordained friendships and relationships. And God turned uh, that, 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 that middle seat experience <laughs> into a God-ordained relationship through which I believe over the years, a lot of people will be impacted around the world. And um, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor and privilege to be here this morning. And, uh, you know, I always thank God for the privilege that he gives me to stand as a, as a testimony to the saving grace and the resurrection power of Jesus. So there is no greater honor. There is no greater privilege. And uh, this morning, the presence of Jesus is here. I was telling Pastor Ed, as we were having the time of worship, I could sense, experience the presence of the resurrected Jesus. He is here today. He is here to touch you. He is here to heal you. He is here to set you free. I don't know what kind of a week you have had. I don't know what in the middle of you are right now. But that does not really matter. You are in the right place. You are in the presence of the miracle worker. You are in the presence of the healer. You are in the presence of the savior. You are in the presence of the greatest with whom nothing is impossible. I believe if you are here, if you are here with an open heart, with faith and expectation to receive something from Jesus. Don't worry about the man with a funny accent from India. <laughs> you focus on Jesus. He can speak even through my funny accent and do something new in your life so that you walk out different through those doors. You walk out and you will be never the same again. I can say that with confidence because I have experienced Jesus in my life. I know him. I know he can do wonders. I know he can do miracles. And I believe today is your day. Today is your day of miracle. Today is your day of new beginning. Awesome. Yes. Come on. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Praise God. I've only known Pastor Ed um, one through an overnight plane journey where we sat next to each other like this different. I mean, you don't need to spend a lot of time to get to know each other. You know, you, you spent a few hours with somebody close enough like that, you get to know the person. When I walked into that place, walked into that place, into that aeroplane, I saw a happy face. You know, I was thinking, oh man, I need to ask people to get out of the way and move in and all that stuff. So that I, even when I walked in, uh, you know, I didn't know what he was thinking until just, he just said. He was, <laughs> <laughs> he was hoping nobody, he did, didn't show in his face, you know. <laughs> He's a good pastor. <laughs> he got up, he smiled, he said, come on in, take your seat. Is that where you're sitting? He created room for me. And, uh, and, and we just got to know each other a little bit. And then so, through yesterday, uh, Pastor Ed and Lisa, um, I, I, I just got their heart, and their heart was to serve God, and to serve you. And uh, I want to encourage you not to take them for granted. You know, really appreciate the gift that God has given to you through giving you such incredible leaders who have a, who have a vision for you, for your family, for your city, for your suburb. And um, I believe you're going to see great things, great days ahead for Victory Church in Jesus' name. Amen. I have one wife and three children. We have three boys. Timothy is 17, Nathan is 16, and Benjamin is 6. Um, and uh, I, I just love our family, you know, love being a dad. Um, it's, it's an honor, it's a privilege uh, to, to be raised up in a Christian home and to have, to see your children grow up in an environment of faith. Uh, your children grow up in, in an environment of hope, of anything can happen. Nothing is impossible. You know, you, every single one of you, your families, your children have that opportunity. I, I say that because I come from a nation where this is not common. 
where there is a lot of hopelessness. India is the second largest populated nation in the world with over 1.3 billion people. A few years ago when I was in the UK, I went to study in the UK and um, in the 90s, somebody asked me, you know, what is your main industry in India? What do you manufacture the most? I said, human beings. That's what we manufacture the most. <laughs> we make a lot of babies. <laughs> so, if we keep growing like this, pretty soon we will overtake China. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out, the Indians are coming. <laughs> now, yes, but we have millions of people, hundreds of millions of people who never even heard the name Jesus at least once in their life. I have Pastor Manoj along with me here, who have been working with me since 19, sorry, since 2002. And we've gone together to so many unreached towns and villages of India. And when we, have, when we go to many places, we tell them, we have come here to tell you about Jesus. And people ask us, what is it? Is that the name of a product you want to sell? Is that something to eat? When they're hungry, they think it's something to eat. I said, no, he's, he's God. Then the next question is, which, which temple can I find him? Do you have a picture of that God? What kind of sacrifices does that God like? You know, what kind of puja, what kind of rituals do I need to do to please that God? People never heard the name Jesus. The Bible says, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, For there is no other name, no other name, only the name of Jesus. Salvation is only in the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 10, the Bible says, but how can they call on the one they've never heard about? How can they hear unless somebody go preach to them? How can somebody preach unless somebody send them? I believe this is the purpose of existence of the church in this planet. To make Jesus known. The church is not here to be a happy, clappy club. No, the church is out here. The church is in this planet to make this earth like heaven. Yes. Yes. To bring heaven on earth. Yes. You know, a lot of times we debate so much about the length and width of heaven. What heaven look like, looks like. I grew up hearing a lot of sermons talking about heaven. Awesome. Thank God for heaven. We'll get there one day. But let's leave it to God when we get there. We'll find out when we get there. But right now, we have the opportunity of bringing heaven to so many people who are literally living in hell right now. We have the opportunity. Church, that is why we are here. I want to read a passage of scripture. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I was planning to preach about something else, but the Holy Spirit this morning prompted me to this passage. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 26. It says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We know the context of this passage. David's three elder brothers, they were fighting in the army with Saul. David was shepherding the sheep of his father. And one day his dad, Jesse, he tells David, go and find out what's going on with your brothers. At that time, there was no telephone, no, no mobile phones, no fax machines, no internet. Somebody had to go or somebody had to come, even no postal system. So David, great. So he left the sheep with another shepherd. That's a, that's a leadership message there itself. He left the sheep with another shepherd. He was a responsible shepherd. And he took the cheese sandwiches that his mother made and um, went to see his brothers. He went there, left the food with the man of the supplies. He ran up to the line. He greeted his brothers. And he heard, he saw something rather amusing. One side of the valley, all the armies of Israel had lined up. On the other side, on the other valley, side of the valley, all the army of the Philistines had lined up. And he saw the Israelite army, which, of which his brothers were part of. They, were, they would come out of their tents. They would shout the war cry. They would make a lot of noise. It's like, okay, I was about to talk about sledging in cricket, but you don't play cricket. 
<laughs> they, would, they, would, they would sledge and they would shout the war cry. They would say, we are going to tear you to pieces today. You know, we are going to do this, we are going to do that. They would shout and scream and everything and they would run towards the line of control. And then one guy from among the Philistines, he would, he would come out of his tent. He would stand tall and he would, he would start intimidating the Israelites. And as soon as this guy comes out, the war cry goes down and they begin to sing a different song. Something like, how great is that guy? <laughs> sing with me. You know, they begin to talk about the problem. They begin to talk about how great, how big was Goliath. And David saw this and he said, something is not right here. Something is not right, right here. And he began to ask people what's going on. And his brothers came and, 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 and he basically asked them, what are you doing here? Go and look after the, those sheep, the few sheep that you have. Go mind your own business. That's what they were saying. You know, that sounds like a really nice thing for every one of us to say. I'm just a normal guy. I mind my own business. I go to church in the morning, Sunday mornings. I pay my offering, my tithe. I sing my songs. I hear the message. I come back. I pray. I mind my own business. Friends, if the church mind their own business, the world will never be different. If the church minds their own business, the world will never change. We are not called to mind our own business. Actually, David stood up. He stood out. And he basically said, this is my business. This is my business. I will mind this business. Because he brought a complete different perspective there, which I want to talk about today. You know, the Israelite army, they saw this problem as a political problem. As a national problem. They saw it as a, you know, in the light of what it appeared to be. But David had a different perspective. He brought God into the picture. He saw this as a spiritual problem. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should uh, defy the armies of the living God? Why did he get that perspective? Because if you look at the previous chapter, the prophet Samuel came into his village. David didn't go looking for Samuel. Samuel came looking for Jesus. For David, that's a, that's a sign of salvation. That is symbolic of our salvation, of grace. You know, we didn't go looking for God. God came looking for us. Yeah. He came and he found us. Yeah. And then Samuel anointed David with oil. That was a, that's a symbol of anointing of the Holy Spirit. We have been saved we have been baptized. We have been anointed. We have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Why? Not to have church in church. To be church in the world. Amen. Amen. That, you know, that, that is what the anointing is for. Now the Bible says, when we are saved, when the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit testifies. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. We are the sons of God. When we live every moment with the awareness that I am a son of God. I love that song. That is, I am a child of God. I am a child of who? I am a child of God. I am a child of God who is the creator of the universe. I am a child of God who owns this planet. I am a child of God who, to whom the earth belongs. So when I see a problem in my neighborhood, when I see a problem in the world around me, with the Holy Spirit living inside of me, bearing witness that I am a son of God, it changes my perspective. I live in Mumbai, the largest populated city in India. Over 23 million people living in our city. More than 8 million people living in the slums. You saw some of that. Over 300,000 children living on the streets. We could look at that and say, this is a law and order problem. This is a political problem. It's the responsibility of the government. 
It's the responsibility of the police department. Let the Child Welfare Committee take care of that. But when the Holy Spirit living in, is living inside of you, and the Holy Spirit begins to bear witness in your spirit that you are a son of God, you are a child of God, then you look at this problem a little different. Then it's not the police department's problem anymore. It's my problem. Because this world belongs to my dad. Amen. This belongs to my father. In the eyes of God, I am his hands and feet. Yes. In the eyes of God, I am his government. Yes. This is not the will of God. It's not the will of God that people live, here, live under the bridge. Yes. Every year, more than 2.2 million children in India die of malnutrition. Does this reality have to exist when the church is alive? I'm talking about India because I, because I come from there. I know your nation have, you have your own problems. Yes. All over the world, there are more than 30 million people in modern day slavery right now. Yes. I'm talking about 2018. More than 30 million people in slavery. In 1809, when slavery was legal, the, I hate to use these terms, but we need to, to understand the magnitude of the problem. 1809, when slavery was legal, the cost of a slave was 40, equivalent to 40,000 US dollars. Only very wealthy people could afford. Do you know what it is today? The cost of a slave today in 2018, where civilization, information technology, everything is at its peak. At its peak, the cost of a slave is only $90. $90. Where have we gone? Where are we going? Does the church have a responsibility? Does the church have a job to do here? I believe so. I believe so. Out of 30 million plus people in slavery worldwide, 14.7 million are in India. Out of that 8.2 million are children. Friend, this is not the will of God. This is not the kingdom of God. This does not need to exist when we are alive. 1996, I had just finished Bible college. And I came back to India and I was in Mumbai for some work. I'm from a small country town in the southernmost part of India called Kerala. Beautiful, beautiful place. I did not like Mumbai. You know, I didn't like the crowd, the slums, the you know, pollution. But I was there for some work. And as I was there, I was in a three-wheeler taxi, which we called rickshaw. And the rickshaw stopped at a signal, and I saw a bunch of children running to the rickshaw. And one little girl, about six years old, she got my attention. She was very skinny, looked extremely malnourished. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't speak the language there. I took whatever cash I had in my pocket, gave it to her. And as the rickshaw got moving, out of curiosity, I looked back, and I saw an older girl snatching this cash from the child. It made me angry. I felt frustrated, helpless. I went back to my hotel room, and I said, God, if you are God, if you are good, if you are loved, and if you are almighty, and I know you are, why do you allow this to happen? Why do you allow such exploitation to exist? I began to shoot a lot of questions to God for which I, had, I heard no answers. Instead, I heard another question. God asking me, what are you going to do about it? If I'm not part of the answer, I'm part of the problem. I didn't expect that. I went back, you know, we went to Goa, we started a church planting training school. But every time I would come through Mumbai, this would come back. Until I heard about a child on the street in Mumbai. He was hungry and he was naked and a stray dog was lying next to him and this boy was drinking the milk from the dog. Mm. By the time we had two children, when you become a dad, everything changes, right? I felt God was asking if that was your son and if you had the resource to stop that from happening, would you do something? I said, God, I will do everything that I can to get my child getting anywhere close to that. I felt the Lord say to me, they are my children, and I do have the resource. You are my resource. 
That was it. Me and my wife and a couple of volunteers, we went to the streets. We started with six kids. We began to feed them. We had no idea you know, what to do. We had no idea what we were getting into. We bought some snacks, sat down on the platform, began to feed them. Ten children, fifteen children, thirty children, they would come. It took us more than a month to even find out their real names because they don't trust anybody. I remember I wanted to hug a little boy. I put my hand out, he just stepped back. Because every time somebody lifted their hand, it's probably to push him or to slap him or to abuse him. He was scared of a touch. I had two children by the time. We started small. Then God began to open doors. God began to open doors. We got a bus. We turned that into a classroom. You saw that in the video. We began, because if a child does not go to school, there is no future. These children have ended up on the streets because somebody along the line, their parents or grandparents, made a poor life choice. They made a poor choice because they were not aware of options out of which they could make a choice. That was because they were not educated. If we could bring education to these children, we could give them access to information so that they could make a good life choice and their children will not be on the streets. We started edu educating them with the bus. Then we could do, do, because we had a bus, we had wheels, we could do multiple locations. We had multiple buses. We started with six children and today, by the grace of God, over the years, we have been able to give and we educate them and we feed them. Over the last 14 years, by God's grace, we have been able to give over 4 million nutritious meals on the streets of Mumbai, Calcutta, and Chennai. Wow. Glory be to God. And educate thousands of children, bring dignity, hope, freedom from exploitation. Why? Because Jesus is alive. You know, David, I want to come back to my passage and, 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 and come to a closer here. David said, I will go fight him. You know, the church is like, a lot of times, like this Israelite army making a lot of noise inside the line of control. You know, we've been making a lot of noise. I've been making a lot, lot of noise in the church, casting out demons in the church, you know, talking to the devil inside the church. I believe it's time for us to get on the other side of the line. Amen. Amen. The power of the church will be revealed when we get to the other side of the line. Amen. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Salt does not need, need to remain with the other salt shaker. Salt. In the salt shaker. Salt needs to engage with things that are not salt. For the, for the power of the salt to be revealed. David said, I will go. You know the story. He went to the other side. He crossed the line. Then he began to talk to Goliath. He said, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Amen. And he took that, took what he had. In the name of the Lord, anything works. Amen. What we had was little snacks. We started with those few snacks and 50 cents, that was our budget. Actually, 60 cents, to be precise. 60 cents worth of snacks in the name of the Lord. We started, we went to the other line with that little stone. And God came through. God came through. I believe this is a new season for Victory Church. Talking to Pastor Ed and Lisa, I really have a sense in my spirit that Victory Church is about to go to another level. Yes. You are about to go to a new season. And that new season will start as, as you saw on the screen when you start going to the other line, other side of the line. Yes. Amen. There are people in your community who need God. People in your neighborhood who need God. And it's not rocket science to change the world. It's so simple. You don't need to have a PhD in theology. You just need to know how to love. Amen. You need to experience, you need to have experienced Jesus. That's all you need. Like David, he had experienced grace. He had experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us qualify. You qualify. We can go to the other side. Amen. Friend, some of you sitting here, 
Maybe you yourself are a little lost. Your life is dry. You've been coming to church. Uh, you've been doing the right things. But you feel that you've been, your noise have been, your, your voice have always been inside the line. God has been speaking to you. The Holy Spirit has been stirring something in your spirit. But fear has been keeping you back. Anxiety has been keeping you back. There are things, the fear of taking risk has been holding you back. But today, if you would say, God, I will step up. I will go to the other side. God wants to do something in your life. God will start something in your life. I could not even pray properly in my family prayer. But if God can use me, he can use you. He can use you. David was the youngest in the family. He stepped out. All heaven came down for him. God is going to release all of heaven's resources to you, towards you, for you. If you make that choice today, I'm going to step out of the line. Would you do that today? Why don't you stand together? I want to pray for you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Abba, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Lord, we want to thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your amazing presence in our midst, Lord. Lord, I sense your presence here. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. Thank you for ministering to us today. Lord, thank you for stirring our hearts today. I know that you're stirring hearts today. Stir our hearts, Lord. Challenge us, Lord. Draw us into the fullness of everything that you have got in store for us. Lord, I pray for Victory Church. Lord, let today be a new beginning for Victory Church. Let today be the beginning of a new season for Victory Church. Lord, never to look back. Today, let today be the day of stepping on the other side of the line for every single person in this church, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for Pastor Ed and Lisa. Lord, and the leadership team, I speak a blessing over them. I speak a blessing over this church. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I speak every empty seat be filled. In the name of Jesus, I speak this church have multiple services all through the day. Saturday evening service, Sunday all through the day, every day of the week, ministry happening in this place because we step on the other side of the line. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.